Let me tell uh, you about the CV of our uh, speaker. Mr. Robert Curry will be coming from the UK and let's see what he did. He's an astrologist, he's a writer, he is a, uh, he's an instructor and also he has written many uh, software programs on astrology and uh, he has very important works on astrocartography and uh, also he has a company uh, called Equinox uh, and he's printing world maps with Jim Lewis and uh, he is working on the energy networks of our ma uh, maps. And now I would like to give the floor to Hande uh, uh, Barish told us who uh, Dr. Curry is, Robert Curry is. He has worked on astrocartography a lot. Uh, he also positioned astrology as a science and a valuable science. And uh, he has focused on this topic for several years. Dear Robert Curry will be with us. I think the audio is normal. I guess we have a slight audio issue today. Now, Robert Curry's uh, speech, I would like to share it with you. He's going to talk about the miracle of yesterday, uh, the science of tomorrow, uh, through which he's going to share with us, convey with us uh, very important information. Now, a round of applause with Robert Curry. No more. Now, if astronomy is the father of science, astrology is the mother of science. That's what I feel. And to understand this, we need to look at the history of science and astrology. It's the only way I think I can answer this question. And a lot of people believe that astrology was invented under a campfire with a starlit sky and an elder of the tribe looks up and looks at constellations and uses them to illustrate the tribal tales. And there might be something in that, but skeptics then say, well, this is, you know, these heavenly myths have just been passed on over thousands of years, and they've been unchanged and unquestioned. And now they have, we've left, we're left with the superstition that we call astrology. Well, that's how they see it. Now, I'll just get the, now, what, what the skeptics don't know is, that in the region of Mesopotamia, some of our earliest written records were the diaries of the stargazing scholars. From these ancient origins, astrology began to be uh, documented by the civilizations located around the plains and marshes of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And the scientific approach was part of an evolutionary leap in mathematics. And it was only discovered in the last 60 years when they excavated um, uh, cities such as Nineveh and Babylon and realized that this knowledge of mathematics which we had thought was, came from Greece, it actually came from, um, from it, was, it was already existing but in, in Babylon and Mesopotamia throughout that area. And the translation of their cuneiform script revealed over 600 years of nightly observations of celestial movements and terrestrial events. Now, the stargazers would be up in the kind of penthouse suite on the seventh floor, looking nightly, uh, observing the stars, and recording everything that went on. It wasn't just you know, the eclipse they would record. They record the water levels on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They record battles, what was happening to the king, what the weather was like. And it's really, this is really what astrology is, that in the, the connection or the correlation between the heavens and earth and that's what they were doing at that time and anyway through these careful observations that the character traits associated with the planet seen as predictable gods began to take shape and this led on to the first 12 sign zodiac which 475 BC planets and signs 419 BC and nine years later the first birth chart in 410 BC 
And their astrological techniques went on to Hellenistic astrology, and the astrology we use, a huge amount of it, came from this region of Mesopotamia, and it was developed in a scientific way. Um, the, these are, it's like a huge database that they produce. In fact, the project was almost like NASA, um, you know, with a huge amount of uh, investment of the scholars of the day in developing this. Anyway, astrology was more of a technology than a religion. And like all technologies, it spread around with Alexander uh, and through trade. Um, but also, um, it merged with the tradition of ancient Greece, and the, um, which is more to do with philosophy, mythology, and then there was a kind of more enchanting and magic and medical side that came from Egypt. And so combining these formed astrology. And funny enough, it was probably more scientific in the Mesopotamian time than it was during this time, but it was more useful to us as human beings through this merger of the, at least three different major civilizations. Anyway, during the Hellenistic uh, era, astrology flourished, and most no notably, there's Ptolemy's work. Now, Ptolemy uh, put a causal relationship on the, on the planets, uh, which wasn't really established in the Mesopotamian time. So this was the science of the day. So again, he was a scientist, and uh, this, this was his development. Get, and then what happened is astrology was high science, but then it went in the Roman Empire, uh, which Ptolemy is a Roman citizen. Uh, it, became, it was used by emperors, and uh, we have here uh, Augustus, who put, this is actually his moon sign, a lot of books say it's his sun sign, but his moon was actually in Capricorn, and I, we, I think they thought that, Cat, that Saturn was the status of authority that they wanted to put onto the Roman Empire. And then we had Tiberius, who tended to, if an astrologer got it wrong, they tended to end up going down this ravine. So was, you had to be very careful making predictions, and Thrasyllus, his astrologer, was asked by Tiberius, uh, Tiberius said, when, Emperor Tiberius, Tiberius in Rome said, when will, I, when will I die? And Thrasyllus thought about this and he said, you will die three days after me. And that meant that he was not going to be thrown down the ravine. Uh, it guaranteed his sort of safety as an astrologer and he persisted. Anyway, so we've got these stages. And what I'm saying is, let's just see if I get, there we go. Yeah, we've got sort of stage one, it went from Babylon. And it was sort of uh, a sort of high science in Babylon. And then it went to Rome and Greece and became less, less scientific. And then it was very scientific in Alexandria with Ptolemy and other astrologers at that time. Then it went to Rome and then it became less scientific because in Rome, it, despite the emperors uh, using astrology and approving of it, astrologers managed to, or some subversive astrologers managed to predict the deaths of the emperors. This didn't go down well, and it tended to be um, outlawed at different stages. So, and it, but it would remain popular among the soothsayers, and they were called Chaldeans, uh, which was slightly pejorative at the time. And then we're moving from Hellenistic Greece to the Islamic Caliphate, and then it became a high science again. And uh, it was, uh, there were many de you know, great developments, and the knowledge was preserved because you know, people were worried it might have been lost through the um, library at Alexandria, but then it was, in this uh, civilization, it was preserved, but it moved from being, again, from being a high science to a more popular subject. And I've just sort of put them as apps, because what happened is it, many people say, well, astrology and astronomy is separated because uh, astronomy is... Um, because of scientific, for scientific reasons. But in fact, it turns out that uh, what was acceptable in the Islamic civilization was uh, astro you know, astronomy and astrology or sky watching was okay for telling the time, for telling the direction of, of Mecca, for navigation, or for pr predicting the weather or estimating the seasons, or for the lunar calendar, or for working out the dates for religious festivals like Ramadan. But prediction was not allowed or not approved of, not acceptable, and that's when astrology and astronomy separated 
um, into two different fields. Um, so we've got this history here where I see we've got sky watching as the general thing and then it's split into astronomy and astrology, like I say. And what happened was astrology got incorporated the tribal myths, but we also have from astrology many of the civilizations developed celestial pantheons, like in Greece we had the Olympian gods. And uh, from that, we look also in Egypt, and we look at Akhenaten, who had one god, and so through sun worship. And from that, now this is obviously some people wouldn't agree with this, but we have Moses coming out of um, Egypt with monotheism, and we now have modern religion. So it, astrology could well be the basis for most of the religions that we know, or certainly part of the basis. But that's not so much what we're, why we're here. We're looking at the other things that came out, the scientific parts that came out. Now, in the Babylonian times, this, as I said, was the formation of mathematics. So we have, obviously, geometry, number theory, algebra, developing from the, the movement of the planets. And it, 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 they say that maths came from trade and people wanting to trade with each other. But I think it also came from people trying to measure positions of the planets, the angles of the planets. And uh, it also developed timekeeping, horology, and navigation, as we said before. Came. And these are, these are sciences that came from sky watching. And from this, we've had a split. Uh, so what I'm saying is that astrology or sky watching has been fragmented into these many fields, including psychology, and some of them is still happening, like seasonal biology is one word people use, uh, and they claim, the scientists who, who do it claim that it's not astrology, but it is certainly very similar to what the Babylonians were doing from their ziggurats, um, working out the seasons and, and relating it to our lives and illness that might be affected at certain times of the year. Anyway, but the disadvantage of this, the fragmentation, is it's very difficult for, uh, if you're an expert in one field, to actually help people. And if you want to help people, I believe that all astrologers really need to understand astronomy and a little bit about all these fields, because that enables you to understand the bigger picture and, and help with solutions. So we have these natural philosophers who were really this is the word for scientists in the day, and all of these were astrologers. Newton's a bit controversial, but we have Copernicus, and Copernicus said that uh, it was astrology that inspired him to see the sun as the center of, of the solar system, uh, and not the earth that it originally was. Um, and we have Cardamo, who invented uh, or discovered probability theory. So if a skeptic is to say, well, you know, astrologers don't understand probability. Well, we invented it. Um, we also have John Dee, who worked for Queen Elizabeth I in England, and he used the code 007. The origin of 007, which is used in the James Bond film, came from him. It was the code. And seven is a number that often comes up in astrology because of the seven, the seven planets, the known planets at the time. We had Galileo, who, whose charts we've discovered, who got into trouble. And he got into trouble for doing astrology, but not because of science, but he got into trouble with religion. Uh, he got into trouble for lots of, lots of reasons, but there was astrology was part of it. He was too deterministic, or that's what the church said. And then we have Johannes Kepler, whose three laws were developed. And astrology was fundamental. Again, like a lot of these things, the history has told a different story about Newton and, Gallet and Kepler. And Kepler's interest in astrology, there's still books that say he was not an astrologer or he only did it for the money. But there are very good instances where he obviously did it. He lost a child and he did a horoscope for the child and corresponded about that. And he wouldn't, wouldn't have done that if ast uh, astrology meant nothing. But he, his third law, which was to do with the, um, r the ratio between the orbital movement of the planets and the distance, uh, went on, or his three laws actually went on to help Newton develop theory of gravitation. And Newton 
was not an astrologer, as far as we know. And uh, he certainly knew about astrology, and astrology lent, led him into geometry. He bought a book, and he went in to study uh, geometry as a result of, the, of an astrology book. And he was an alchemist. Uh, that we do know, and if you were an alchemist, you very likely understood astrology. He certainly understood the symbolism of astrology. But one of the things about Newton, to be an astrologer, you also need to have a certain type of character and a character that's interested in human beings. And Newton was a very unusual, very solitary individual, and consultations would not have been his kind of behavior. So that, that's one reason why he's not, as far as we know. Now, there were four discoveries that challenged astrology. And, the first, and all of them, I would say, have no impact on astrology should have. But at the time, it knocked the wind out of astrology. And so the first is the procession of the equinox, and uh, basically the signs or the constellations have moved relative to the signs. And for some people, this seems to be a problem. But the fact is the constellations of the zodiac and the signs of the zodiac are different things. In fact, there are three zodiacs. I call it the sidereal zodiac, which is, not, which is divided into 30 sections. So it doesn't quite correspond to the constellations. And there's the astronomical zodiac, and the zodiac that we're interested in Western astrology is the tropical zodiac, uh, measured from the equinox from today. This is the first day of the, uh, when the sun falls into this point. So that, that isn't uh, a problem. But for some people, even Stephen Hawking was saying that he thought this is why astrology didn't work anymore. Even, even uh, this was a quote in India. Um, and then there was also the, the sun in the center. People said, well, look, it's a geocentric system. Uh, how, you know, astrology, we, how can we do charts with the Earth in the center when the sun's in the center? And it turns out that when you do a map, you know, if you do a map, wherever you're located, having that place in the center is the most sensible way. That, that would never be a reason for something not to work. Uh, we also, the, the outer planets are quite an interesting thing because, you know, people said, well, why didn't the astrologers predict the outer planets, the existence? And I don't know whether they did or they didn't, but... What I do know is their existence has greatly enhanced astrology and changed, for me, it's changed the rulership and it's, um, you know, I couldn't imagine doing charts without them. But, uh, you know, that, so there's some people, you know, argued on that. And then the current argument is the vast distances of space are so great that the planets could not possibly have any connection with us. Uh, and that's a scientific argument that... Uh, um, it's put forward, but there are, there are, I've written a paper on this, but I can't go into explaining everything but, uh, about it. But uh, I do assure you that it's, it's not an issue, not within our solar system. Um, but we get this interesting situation. We get astrology then, uh, for the Age of Enlightenment, sort of went underground. And I'll explain an example why. We look at Ben Franklin, and who was one of the founding fathers of America, I think he's on the $10 bill. This is Karen, my wife, and she will, is it the $10 bill? $100 bill. But anyway, but, well, again, is it the $100 bill? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, he's, uh, anyway, he is a found, one of the founding fathers. He was, he was an astrologer, uh, which is not very well known. And he was also assisted by uh, bifocals and uh, the lightning conductor. But he also wrote a book called, uh, under the title of Paul Richard, which is an almanac uh, that came out every year. And so we get a situation where an astrologer is using a pseudonym for, to do astrology. And this was a trend that happened with many astrologers during a subsequent to that period. And it's only gone back, maybe in the last 50 years, where people are starting to use their own names to be astrologers. Uh, and then we had a, uh, a, de a development that was important, and it relates to Ptolemy, who put in the causal relationship. We now have Jung, who, who's, who developed an a-causal relationship with Wolfgang Pauli, who is a Nobel physicist, and talking another scientist, one of the pioneers of uh, quantum physics. Uh, and the two of them worked together on the theory of synchronicity, which um, basically uh, just, I'm sure people know what it is, but I'll just say it, which is the coincidence of two or more events that are causally unrelated or acausal, but have a meaningful connection. And the obvious example for us is the planetary alignments and events on Earth. And this was an important development within astrology. Now, Jung did try to do some experiments, because we're coming a bit more onto the experimental side. And what happened was 
he tested out married couples and he found constantly the woman's moon was aspected by the partner, the men's son, or the men's ascendant, or the man's moon. But there was no consistency. It was all in a certain direction. And so he, he did find an effect, but he, he, he said that the inconsistency was down to Mercurius. He, he felt there was some kind of trickster at work that was stopping him from pinning down astrology in a scientific way. It's a subject that interests me, but it's another area. We also have, at the same time, we had sun sign astrology developing with the sister of the Queen, Princess Margaret, and she, they did a horoscope for her in one of the national newspapers, Daily Mail in the UK, and from that point, it came with a column for each signs, and this spread like wildfire. So this is where we've gone from the high science of the, of the natural philosophers, Kepler, to the low science. This is not science. Um, this is, it's just it's, it's a very, it made astrology very popular, but it's not um, a scientific thing. But just as the nails were being hammered into the coffin of astrology, along came... Uh, two, uh, as, as a psychologist, Michel Gauquelin, Francois and his wife, Francois Gauquelin, who started to collect records. And they were pretty skeptical about astrology, but they found an effect that they could not explain. And the effect was, you, this is, uh, I think this is scientists, Saturn and, and physici physicists and scientists in uh, the Academy Francaise. And this is a large collection of, um, large database. And he, he showed this with what we call a polar graph, showing that planets were just past the angles in the charts. And in the case of scientists, it actually was Saturn. It's also Mars came up in scientists. So he found that um, this, this, this structure. Now, I personally think that, I don't know if you notice how it's just past the midheaven there, just past the ascendant. And I think this is to do with the time and the recording of the time. There's always a delay. Um, in, in my own experience, when, when a baby is born, people are not thinking about the time. And nowadays, it, it does, and people look right away. And uh, I've looked in research I've done more recently. His effect is there, but it's much closer to the midheaven and the timing. Uh, he said his effect does not work on induced births. So, um, and his effect, what he found was quite a small effect, but a point that Glenn made earlier is that he, um, I think you said astrology is polyvalent, or there are multi-factors that go into a chart. And Gokulon is looking at just one, and he never tested astrology in a, in, a, in a synthetic way as a chart or looking at a number of factors at the same time. So I think that his study, he, it, was a, it was a strange lucky break. The thing about it was his numbers were so huge uh, that it was very, very, it was irrefutable in the technical side, but we'll see that a lot of people tried to dispute it. And one person who felt very disturbed by it was a uh, philosophy professor, uh, Paul Kurtz, uh, from Buffalo, New York, and he founded a group called PSYCHOP, which was to investigate the paranormal. But astrology was very disturbing because in 1977, he got a group of 146 scientists to sign a list of objections to astrology, and their main objection was this vast distances of space. It can't possibly work because of the vast distances of space. And we had one person who refused to sign, was Carl Sagan, uh, who is a famous, I mean, I'm sure you may have heard of him, but a wonderful broadcaster um, on astronomy, this a series called Cosmos. Uh, and this is all in the 70s, um, well, when this happened. And he said, why did he refuse to sign? He said that, that we can now think of no mechanism for astrology is relevant but unconvincing. No mechanism was known, for example, for continental drift when it was uh, proposed by Wegener. Never nevertheless, we see that Wegener was right, and those who objected on the grounds of unavailable mechanism were wrong. So the argument about the mechanism is not an argument to say, if you get an effect, it's an effect. Uh, you don't have to have a mechanism because you can't dismiss an effect because you don't know the mechanism. And that often is a problem for skeptics. But anyway, from Paul Kurtz, he then developed uh, the Skeptical Inquirer, which he, uh, it's a bi-monthly magazine, which is for skeptics. And he was, it was the sort of start of the movement. And I think it wasn't so much Gokulan that got him going. I think it was the sun sign astrology, which is very popular. And that motivated him as a reaction. And Gokulan 
sort of surprised him, and he thought, well, I'll very easily prove it wrong. Now, there was a problem. He took up the challenge, uh, and many people in Europe were also trying to challenge Gokulan's claims. And he investigated Gokulan's claims, and there was a problem, because his chief, chief statistician, called Dennis Rawlings, discovered that the data, well, he discovered that the data was supporting Gokulan, and that Kurtz, or someone within PSYCOP, was uh, falsifying the data in order to suppress the effect. Uh, and this is a very serious uh, issue. And uh, Rawlings took the problem up. And they didn't, uh, Psychop and Kurtz refused to do anything about it. And so he resigned. And this was caused a big scandal. He wrote an article called Star Baby, uh, which was published in Astrology magazine. And it's available on the web. But it's a fascinating story about what actually happened there because it was very, um, uh, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very uh, black day for the skeptical world. But I think it's worth remembering that some skeptics are, prepared, are so disturbed by the idea that something like astrology could work that they would be prepared to go to various levels to do that. Um, anyway, so uh, after, so uh, as Glenn mentioned earlier, uh, Michel Gokulin, who was never accepted by science, apart from one person, Professor Hans Eysenck, uh, who was a very famous psychologist, but, uh, and he, he committed suicide in, uh, I think it was uh, 1985, I'm not sure, I have to check. But anyway, after his suicide, uh, no, um, his work was ch checked by this Professor Supert Ertl, who then published a book called The Tenacious Mars Effect. And basically, he found, he got all the data from the skeptical groups, so not just collected by Gokulan, Gokulan's data, put it all together, and the effect was stronger than Gokulan had actually thought. And it's an amazing book. It's a very small publication. It will cost you $150 on, the, uh, on Amazon because there were very few copies made, and I keep it on my shelf, I don't lend it to anyone because it's, it's, it's a very useful thing, very interesting thing, but it's not very well known. Now, the problem is no one has ever come up with a plausible explanation as to what Gokulin was, was doing other than astrology. This man, Jeffrey Dean, we'll talk about in a second, he said that the parents were tampering with the birth times, and they were making up, falsifying the birth times, but if anyone knowing astrology, why would a scientist family in France, scientific family in France, uh, who, and they uh, have a child, why would they want Mars and Saturn, which were considered pretty difficult planets, on very strong places uh, in order, what would be the advantage? Because he was saying, well, look, they put the moon there, and they can become a writer, or uh, Jupiter there, they could become a politician. Um, that may be true, but, uh, but it still works for planets that were difficult. So there really isn't, it, it isn't plausible, but it's one of the sort of, uh, things that skeptics will do in order to um, discredit it. Um, anyway, so this was a very embarrassing episode for Paul Kurtz. Uh, a lot of people resigned after this in his in the psychop, and he felt he had to get some proof that there was nothing in astrology. So he decided not to do it publicly, but support it covertly. So we now know, and we didn't know at the time, that uh, he did a thing called the Carlson Test, which he supported, and a lot of members of PSYCOP were involved. For example, the publisher was uh, John Maddox, who was also a fellow of PSYCOP, of the experiment. Now, this experiment involved it bl uh, blind choices of three. So astrologers had to match uh, a real chart to a psychological profile and two false charts. And he said they could not do it uh, any better than chance. And it also turned out that the subjects could not match their own psychological profile, even though they uh, were able to see the psychological profile you know, written that they had submitted themselves. But Professor Ertl, again, worked out that when the astrologers rated their choices, because these were all students at the same university, um, you know, all very similar, same age, same generation, and the similarities were very strong. So sometimes an astrologer said, well, I can't choose. They often said, I can't choose between these three. And so I'm going to rate my choice as a zero strength confidence because they're so similar. But some, I said, I really know. Now, when you look at that, uh, you can see that the astrologers rated much higher the choices on average 
that were, uh, where they could see the difference and much lower when they couldn't. Now this really is the way um, astrology could be confidence rated because uh, with the astrologers that begin to say, oh yeah, of course they'll pick the charts and they'll pick out this percentage, which they didn't do it as, as confidently as it was expected. But it turns out anyway that it, it was a positive. So anyway, the story so far. Astrology was discovered by empirical research. It wasn't just invented. Um, it was developed by the leading natural uh, astrologer, the founding fathers of science. Uh, it, the separation of um, astrology ha happened more from the original separation of astrology and astronomy. It was more to do with religion. Uh, and we've always had a strong fundamentalist group that have resisted astrology. And first it was religion. Today it is it's scientism, not science, scientism, which is different because it's the belief that science can explain everything. And I think it's very important that astrologers, um, we have a good relation with science because it is not, it is very much our friend. Um, because as far as science is concerned, astrology is, it's not for the sign, someone who likes scientism, they'd say astrology is, if it's not proved, it must be false. For anyone in science, if it's not proved, it's not proved. That's all it is. It's neutral. You can't say something's false just because it's not proved. So there's a big difference. And a lot of people like the idea that, you know, uh, oh, I'm a scientist and a skeptic, and therefore this. the two, skeptic's okay, but a sign, someone who supports scientism is not a scientist. Um, someone like Richard Dawkins, for example. Now, one man we talked about, uh, Jeffrey Dean, who is perhaps the long, strongest critic of astrology, he was around at the Carlson test. How he got there, I don't know, but he happened to be there. Someone might have flown him there, I don't know, because he lives in Australia, and the Carlson test happened in Berkeley, in California. Uh, anyway, and he published these two books. This was in, uh, I think it was in, check the year. well, it was about, yeah, it was about 30 years ago. And this is his recent publication. Now, I did a review of this book. Now, the first book actually was pretty good, as books go. It was a bit negative, but it looked at all the artifacts, which we'll talk about, that you find in astrology experiments. And a lot of things will go wrong, a huge number. And it left a very small, a huge book, and very small number of experiments that were supportive of astrology. Obviously, Gokulau was one of them. And he then published this book, which is a, uh, turned out to be very skeptical. I wrote a review. And I, it, it's published in a, a correlation journal. Um, basically, he was quite stung by this review. He contacted me and has asked me to collaborate on republishing the book. And could I supply him with various experiments and update him on various things? So we are in a discussion. I hope he will republish. But he is, um, he's a fellow of Psychops, so he is unlikely to say anything very favorable. But perhaps if he could tone down his latest book, that would be something and perhaps base it, become a little bit more scientific because uh, it, is, it is very biased. He tried to sort of make out that it's the case for and against astrology, but it is very much the case against astrology, not the one for. Um, anyway, so we've got these artifacts, uh, which are kind of artificial things that are not to do with astrology that come up in experiments. And you suddenly think, oh, this is so exciting. And, uh, you know, examples are... Um, selection bias, um, for example, with the Carlson test, to select a, a homogenous group of students who are, you know, same course, that is actually selection bias because you can't separate people if they're all very similar, be an example, or people, you know, cherry pick. Um, there are other things, astronomical effects, like a Mars uh, conjunct the sun is much more common, Mars opposite the sun. So you have to have a control group to make sure that uh, this you know, that these astronomical effects are removed. And there's social artifacts, which is a, a big, big problem, because a lot of people know their sun sign. Any test of a sun sign, you have to say, well, maybe um, a Scorpio might tick the box saying that I'm intense because I know that that's a quality of Scorpio. And so that means that sun sign tests are often, you know, you can, you can show evidence of astrology, but people will say, well, hold on a second, that's because they know the signs, but if you take out a sun sign, then you have another problem because the sun sign is very important uh, and uh, you sort of take the heart out of an experiment. Um, so it is, it is difficult to get the, those kind of tests. Uh, anyway, what 
was important. It wasn't just astrologers who weren't doing the tests, it was also skeptics. Uh, this is Hans Eysenck, arguably at the time the most famous psychologist in the world, uh, with, cited around the world. And he wrote, um, in his research into Gokula, he made the comment that basically skeptics were making the errors. It wasn't just a one-sided thing. Um, now, I did this cartoon to try and talk about um, Jeffrey Dean's uh, review, and this is his approach, and this is how it has been, and it starts, you know, they're really, this is in the 50s, pre-50s, there is no evidence, and the astrologer said, well, I'll do, um, I will do some proper testing uh, of astrology, and then in the 50s to the 70s, okay, some tests came up, uh, but they're all full of artifacts, that was the big problem, that's his book, Recent Advances in Astrology, by the way, I, I mean, that is, you could say that might be Jeffrey Dean, um, but I called it Dr. No. Uh, I didn't want to be too personal, but I can tell you here now that that was the objective. And, um, and then they said the tests were full of artifacts, and they said, right, we're going to do more, and we're going to do lots of uh, larger samples. And, and then he said, okay, one test works, which is Michel Gokulin's, but it's not astrology. He said it wasn't astrology because the sun wasn't exactly on the mid-heaven, even though it followed the traditions of astrology. And so we've got the astrologer based on a friend of mine who's, a, who's uh, um, uh, interested in re research. And uh, is, uh, uh, used her avatar with her permission. And then it came up, the latest thing is we've got results. We've got tests, not many, but we've got results. And so Dean has said, well, okay, we've got the results, but the effect size is so small. Um, and uh, so this is the next thing we need to look at. But an effect is an effect. And if you think of um, something like Marie Curie, who was discovering radi radiation, she had to refine, I think it was pitch blend, uh, she had to refine, it was, it was a huge amount of work. And it's work that would require a lot of funding. So there are not many astrologers who will find an effect and then work and work, like Michel Gokuna, to, to get that effect stronger. Um, in fact, Michel Gokuna never really looked at other planets to sort of study how it could work in conjunction with other things. Anyway, now, the evidence. Uh, we have uh, a number of tests. Now, I, I, how are we doing on time? Just, uh, we have a number of tests. Oh, sorry. We just, and I've just quoted them by the name of the experiment. These are interesting ones. This was the Carlson test. Uh, these were the skeptical ones, these tests, the purple. And the problem with the blind matching test, we have Vernon Clark, which uh, uh, all these three, in the end, showed that ast astrologers could, in blind matching, select charts. Um, but the problem is that when you do that, the people say, well, that was intuition. You, you managed to choose. Nothing to do with astrology. You were intuitive. So it doesn't actually, it's a no-win situation. And if you don't select them, then it's astrology's fault. But if you do, it's intuition. So it's quite, those are quite difficult tests. They're not very satisfying. Um, and we have a lot of scientists doing work on the moon phase. And this one came out last year, which was uh, Professor Kajogan, Swiss professor, who was uh, quite skeptical. And he said the, uh, that he looked, went back on his data that he collected, nothing to do with... Uh, astrology, but he looked at the moon phase and people's sleep patterns, and he found that people sleep uh, better at the new moon than at the full moon, and he got a very nice kind of curve that shows that. But it needs to be replicated to be show, to show what happened. But it does, and there are many other ones to do with um, uh, uh, you know different different health issues. I I, I've, I have a list of them, and there they will be online uh, if that's of use. Uh, and then financial astrology again. You know, with the financial world, they're not interested is in how astrology works. They want to know whether it works. And so there's a lot of tests in that area. Most of these studies are retrospective. They say, if you invested money at this time, where would it be today? Um, and we also have, uh, these, are, these are really to do with uh, natal astrology. This man, Tarvenin, has done a lot of uh, experiments with um, natal charts and, and synastry. And has come up with some really interesting stuff, and he's still producing stuff. Uh, Bernadette Brady did work on inheritance. Um, and these ones are on the, the hill, did red hair, and the position of Mars 
very common in the charts of people with red hair uh, rising or setting. Uh, and Pat Harris did uh, astrology, he's got a PhD in astrology and fertility study uh, using, um, astro using astrology to predict fertility. Uh, we also have uh, the ones we know, and these are replications of Gokula, where they were done in uh, different situations. Um, again, I, I don't know whether we have time to go in too much to these, but I'll, I can always go back to them if we do. And th these ones were the extreme parts. This was a suicide test, and this one is on extroversion, introversion, and Jan Ruiz was on serial killers. So these are extreme. They're not what most people do in a, uh, when doing a chart, because the, these were extreme uh, extroverts and introverts, not the average type of person. So these, anyway, but they're interesting, but they're, um, you know, it's getting, getting more tests that actually would help astrologers is what I, I'm very interested in. Um, it remains four studies that were skeptical with it about astrology. And they're big studies, and they, they, we, did, we didn't find flaws. Well, initially, flaws were not found. Now, one of them was done by astrologers. New York study is a suicide study. And they took, it was really a very, very well done experiment um, where they took uh, a list of suicides in New York and they had the birth date and birth time, the time of death, and how the person died. And it sounds like a depressing subject. And you know, not like when we're doing charts and we're telling people about relationships and positive things. But actually, this is the astrology that's really useful because if we can, if you think of the problems in the world with depression and people using antidepressants and suicide, which is on the rise, and we don't really understand it. Science has not really found solutions. It's found solutions to fantastic things, but things that are really important. So this study I thought was really interesting, and I contacted the lady who did it, and she supplied me with all the data. And she tested it every which way. But one of the big mistakes I believe they did was they had three different years where people committed suicide. And in each of those years, there were very different planetary situations. So therefore, it affected different people in different ways. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you have a Jupiter and Neptune square Uranus, that will affect a certain type of person. Or if there's a stressed Pluto, there might be an, a different type of person might commit suicide. But the mistake was they looked for things that worked in all three years, and not very much did. Not enough to be significant. So I had a look, and uh, I haven't published the paper as yet, but um, I th there's a number of things that are significant. But you have to look at it as themes within the chart. You have to look at similar things that get reinforced within the chart. I also, uh, Jeffrey Dean supplied me with this study. Uh, I'm not allowed to give it to anyone else. He wouldn't let me pass it on or share it with anyone, which is um, annoying because I've had a lot of people want to look into it. But it's, again, I, I've got some interesting results here. And uh, again, I will come on to this if we get the opportunity. And then Dean did a meta-analysis, which is studying lots and lots of studies. Unfortunately, his meta-analysis mixed studies like he included um, Chinese astrology, Indian astrology, and any tests that he felt would work for his case against astrology. Anyway, uh, and that uh, I think will be, if we can redo that, I think it will be more, much more in favor of astrology. And then there's the Carlson test, which I talked about, which was in favor. So the situation changed. That was the end of the last century. The situation changed. And what happened was we had a number of astrologers got quite disillusioned, and they felt that astrology was simply beyond science. And I would understand it, because all you got at the end of the last century was negative tests about, about it. And many people put forward the idea, and most people put forward the idea are, in the, are quite academic astrologers. And you have to say, well, uh, you know, if you are in an academic environment, if you're at a university, it's a lot easier saying, oh, astrology's got nothing scientific. So you're not challenging science. You're just a kind of more of an arts type of subject. And that makes it much easier. Um, and so maybe that's why academics like that. I don't know. But the, you know, the views of uh, Jeffrey Cornelius have been echoed by, which, which are that it might be damaging for us to do scientific investigation into astrology, because it might damage astrology. And this has been uh, said by... Um, Bernadette Brady and Lee Lehman and Professor Rick Tarnas, and they're all 
um, you know, academic, and, and they're all very, very good astrologers. Jeffrey Dean is a fantastic astrologer, and this is a very good book. And he makes his case for divination, and he says that, uh, you know, he said, look, he, looked, he said he, he would accept Gokula perhaps is scientific. He did say that. But most, of, he looked at all the tests, and he cited the big tests, we said, and he said, look, astrology is um, clearly uh, what he called judicial astrology, which natal astrology is, is divination on that basis. And therefore, uh, it's untestable, and the mechanism is simply unknowable. We don't know. It's supernatural. And, you know, it, 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 he, he puts the case extremely well. Um, now, I'm not sure about the divination. I, I think that some of astrology is, as we'll see, but I'm just saying there are some things about astrology that we can do. We, we, can, we can actually test claims objectively. Um, for example, if you look at a keyword, and if you say, and to use an example Glenn was talking about, was Neptune and addiction, and you say that, well, a scientist will naturally say, well, what is your evidence? You say, you know, how do you know Neptune and addiction? And say, what, what's your evidence? And you say, well, I've seen it in lots and lots of people. But the scientists say, well, look, have you done a test? What if you've got a group of people? Well, it just happens that with Neptune, uh, Kaisti Tarvenin did do that test. He got 1,793 alcoholics, uh, which had been collected by Misha Gokulna. Misha Gokulna hadn't found this, but uh, what uh, Tarvenin found was Neptune was on the midheaven in 26% more often than in the control group. So it didn't make, say, you know, and someone with Neptune in the midheaven will be an alcoholic, but it's just one factor that might increase the possibility or the potential for that to happen. It's also 14% more common in the first house as well. So they're obviously a strong Neptune. Uh, I, I think, so I think it is quite fair to say that Neptune may be as associated with, with addiction, as an example. The other thing about it is with divination, there's often a random uh, effect. I, I actually quite like the... Um, uh, the I Ching, and I use it, so I'm not against divination, but there normally, normally is a random thing. When you're doing tarot cards, there's a kind of element of randomness. In astrology, we have planetary positions at birth, and to me, these are objective facts. Um, but the other thing is, um, with divination, you know, the idea of the divine is something omniscient. Now, with astrology, we can't say, you get a chart, you can't say if it's a man or a woman, you can't say what race the person is. You can't say what their sexual orientation. Maybe you can. There might may be tests that show that. But generally, you can't, you can't really be certain. You can't even know if someone's alive or dead. Whereas with a psychic, can deal with those and can say, I feel this person. I hold this object, and I can tell this person is a woman. And you know, it's so. And that is, to me, that is what divination is. There's that randomness and the omniscience, and. Um, and, it, and, and, it's, and you can't test, you can't know how it, is, how it works. So, but the interesting thing is this, that Jeff, Jeffrey Cornelius was mainly using horary astrology. So uh, that to me, I, I don't personally use it, and I think it's, I think it's a great system. Um, I, if I had a question, I would use the I Ching. So it's just, uh, I'm, I'm not very good at following rules. That's one of the problems. But Jeffrey, D, uh, sorry, Jeffrey Cornelius did this, and he, uh, what, what I think it exists is that there's two types of astrology, which is the m metric and the mantic. This came to me from a guy called Ken Irving, uh, suggested, and basically, the mantic, which would be horary, which, are air, which might be divination, and the metric was something like an aspect, or something like what Gokulan was investigating, uh, is more likely to be scientific. That's what I feel and where the direction that will eventually be established. But I don't know. When I say divinatory, I'd say intuitive. It might not be divination. It might be something like divination. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, that, that's one of the things. But, you know, with the metric, you can measure it. And that's the difference. Now, another model uh, of astrology is basically astrology is like myth, poetry, lyrics. It's more of an art. And you know, I, I, all these models are great models, and I, I'm not against them. But I and I think there's room for different models within astrology. And you look at all these people; they were, uh, they used astrology in their work. And in addition, there's or we could add um, Carl Jung or the artist Botticelli, 
who also used astrology you know, in their work. And this is a great expression of astrology, but it isn't all of astrology. And when you think of art, you think of the imagination. So it's something that is not, uh, it's, it's not recording the truth, or it's not recording the reliable information. It is recording, it's an impression. And sometimes the imagination, like with Harry Potter, it can be divorced from reality. It talks about reality, but it's not like when we do a chart, you can present it in the most poetic way, most stylish way, but unless it actually connects with that individual, you're not going to get repeat business. Um, but, you know, every astrologer has to have a good chart side manner. That is important. Um, anyway, so more models are, you know, astrology is a therapy of placebo, and I'm all in favor of the placebo, and I'm sure that every astrologer should be able to use that within their practice. But is astrology placebo? That goes against everything that I've experienced, and it goes against the evidence, because the placebo is like a delusion, and that isn't what I see astrology as. And then we have the idea of astrology of language. I agree with that. I think it's a great idea. I can talk to my wife and say, uh, someone has uh, Leah rising, and she'll know what I'm talking about. So there's a language in that sense. But um, it's more than a language. I mean, it is a language, but it's more than a language. Um, Anyway, we have these, does it come down to definition? And I, I know we've had people say this uh, before, is it, is it? Uh, I think Glenn said it, um, you, know, it, you know, the dictionary really doesn't help very much. Systematic and formulated knowledge, especially of a specified type or on a specified subject, e.g. political science. This is the English, Oxford English Dictionary's definition of what is a science. But you know, you could say science is a body of knowledge that can be taught. And if you say that, then you could have history as a science. You could have, um, you know, sociology as a science. Uh, and they would claim they are scientists. But if you have to do everything by the scientific method, if that's what it is, then astrology is not a science. Because we do not do the scientific method. We do in our own way, which, um, but... Not in the, not in the, we have our own way of collecting the data, but it's only a few people are doing it by the scientific method. And then what is astrology? Now, I've often talked to astrologers about getting a kind of definition, and mine is pretty broad, but I think this goes back to the Babylonians, and this is what they were looking at. And, uh, and I put the study of the correlations between celestial bodies and life and events on Earth, and this means that something like the tides which were part of astrology, which were lost, which got fragmented from astrology, are essentially part of astrology. And a lot of things that are quite uh, scientific, such as the study of animals and nature, relating to phases of the moon and uh, uh, solar radiation, are to do with astrology. So I take a, a, a wider base, and in which case, there's a lot of science in that already, and it's well accepted. You know, things like seismic activity, uh, the weather, uh, there's, there's some really interesting studies about how, how the moon, when there's a full moon, the reflected light of the moon actually warms the poles. So that can affect, and the El Nino effect is meant to be to do with then the moon. Uh, when the, the moon in its cycle, uh, it, it moves along the ecliptic, but it goes up and down. And there's a metonic cycle when they, it, it goes up. When it's at the top, uh, they tend to be, uh, the tides tend to be stronger in the Pacific. And when the tides move, the temperature of the ocean tends to be uh, more even. And when the tides don't move, at the other end of the metonic cycle, it gets very hot, and this causes the El Nino effect. So I think when the weather is used, when people understand the, sun, the effects of the sun and the moon on the weather, it, and that, to me, again, I, I claim that as astrology, um, but, uh, and that is, a, that is a, you know, scientific as well. But are astrologers scientists? Now, most, uh, for most astrologers, the practice is, in my opinion, it's an art. 99%, there's maybe 1% who don't think of it, uh, you know, who actually are, are really are scientists in what they do. And one of the, you know, there are a few reasons for this. I mean, one of the things is we, uh, most of what we get comes from tradition, it comes from theory, it comes from symbolism. Uh, it's not actually empirically de derived. Um, also, we've got, uh, but what is interesting is that 
astrology is based on millions of observations. Millions of astrologers over maybe 4,000 years have been collecting and observing. And it's not a very reliable system, but eventually we start to come to conclusions you know, as to why Mars might be associated with what it's associated with. So there is this expression that the plural of anecdote, anecdote is not data, but I think the plural of anecdote, which is all the anecdotal experiences we've all had, actually is data, and I think that's how we've collected our information. Uh, and again, we do a different approach. The astrologers are, are deductive. We go on a basic premise of the connection between the heavens and earth, uh, as above, so below, where, and then we look at the evidence, whereas a scientist will look at a very small example, they'll test it, they'll replicate it and build up a theory from there. So we, have, we come from very different uh, uh, perspectives. We also do qualitative studies versus quantitative, stu quantitative studies, which are now being increasingly used in science. Uh, they're more acceptable because it's not just about numbers. Now, I'm doing a talk tomorrow on astrophotography, and this is really a qualitative study, but I didn't publish it in a journal because you you can't say what are the probabilities of 12 presidents in the United States where we have the times, what are the chances that they will actually reflect the actions of what they did. But anyway, those who come will see the answer on that. Um, astronomy, we revere tradition. Uh, you see, this is one of the things. We do something like Project Hindsight. We have a strong feeling that knowledge has been lost uh, with the loss of the... Um, library in Alexandria and uh, at other stages. I mean, there was a time when uh, Baghdad was uh, attacked by the um, um, by the Mongols, and uh, something like 1258. And the river, there were so many books that they dumped in the river around Baghdad that the, ta the, the river actually went black and red with blood. So there was a uh, there's so much knowledge that's been lost, and we're trying to get it back. And Project Hindsight is translating the primary sources. At the moment, they're looking at Hellenistic astrology, so we're getting back. Science is not really interested in looking back. It's looking forward, and it's more like, let us get rid of the old theory, and let's look for the new. You know, I can see their reasons, but we also have our reasons as well. And is there a consensus? This is another thing. Scientists say, well, we're all, we've got this great consensus, but actually, there is not as much consensus as we might think, uh, certainly about um, uh, you know, areas such as uh, consciousness, uh, um, dark, dark matter, all these kind of areas, uh, climate change even, there, there's a lot of dispute. And astrologers actually have quite a good consensus about the meaning of the planets. We tend to agree. We might not agree in the houses, um, but we do have a large area of consensus. So I, I don't know if we're that far removed from scientists, but I do think that we're not scientists. Um, now, how do we move from a proto-science to a science and that this is, uh, Dean Radin has this idea that, you know, you often get people say, well, astrology violates the laws of science, but we don't actually make a claim like um, a young earth creationist would say uh, the world began in 4,004 years ago on a Saturday. Um, we don't make any claim like that. And I, so I, I think we're beyond that stage. Now, the next stage is, yes, the idea, you know, the idea is possible, but... Uh, Good. Okay, right, we're running over on time. So we're just, anyway, this is the last stage. Anyway, these are, these, are the, these are the ideas of the stages that we're moving to. And the one example is meteorites, which were originally considered to be a ridiculous idea that rocks could come from the sky. And in the 17th century, and they decided that it was, um, uh, that actually it's now become an area of science, but it was dismissed. Um, so is astrology scientific? It has yeah, definitely the origins are scientific. Uh, and it, these are the various conclusions. We take many forms. Are astrologers scientists? No, I don't think so. But sky watching has fragmented, and astrology has given birth to new sciences and or has been the midwife. What is the future? It's possible that astrology might split at some stage into two areas uh, to do with the mantic and the metric. Anyway, um, so the last thing I'm just going to say to finish is, um, so my conclusion is that the mother of science has been separated from her home and family, and it's time she returned to her rightful place in between her scientific sons and her magical daughters. Thank you.